Hello everybody and welcome to another video of programming for data analytics. Today we are going to be learning about data types again. So not about integer string, but about data types to contain lots of information. And you can see here that I listed four of them and those are the built-in data types in Python. One of them are you are expert on at this point. Uh, you, you use lists to make 3D lists and list comprehension and all this fancy stuff that you've done with lists. So if I go in and say, which of these are you an expert on right now? You would say list. So our job today, or my job today, is so that we can say that you are an expert in all four of them. Well, maybe not an expert, but you're familiar enough that you can decide which is the right tool for the job and which is not the right tool for the job. And furthermore, just that you're able to understand differences of them so that, again, you want Python to work for you, so you know you want to pick the best one, okay? So because we already know lists, we're not really going to go too in detail into a list, so you can watch previous videos for that. The only thing I want to point out about a list is the advantages of it that you may take for granted, okay? And so what I'm talking about that is that a list you know, allows you to store data and that data is in an ordered way. So every time that you append something to a list, you are basically inserting that data at upper, you know, at the end of the list, right? You're not, you're not inserting it in the random spot and it is consistent. It's stored there forever until you decide to remove it. So, you know, lists are cool like that. They allow you to basically keep all this information in there and be able to keep it in the same order that you put it in. So if you insert something in the beginning, it's always going to be in the beginning unless you, of course, remove it, okay? On the other hand, if you, uh, if you, if you are interested in accessing an, an item that is somewhere else in the list, like let's say it's the fourth item, you're able to access it through the index of that. So if I say, you know, if I have a list called L and I'm trying to access the second element of that list, then I would put L1, right? Because I start from zero indexing. So I know that it's always going to return to me the first element. And this is nice. And most of the time, lists are the right tool to use. But there are some limitations to what lists can achieve. And the most important one, or not important, but at least the easiest one to understand, that is important too, but it's easy, is speed. So this is in the computer science course. If, if you're interested in looking at time complexity and asymptotic complexity in detail, you can check out my CS302 videos in C++, but you can check those out and really understand uh, you know, data structures and that kind of thing. So we're not going to go into that level of in depth, but I do want to give you a taste of that. So when you're designing a program, you typically are designing some methods to store information because most programs have information they handle. Otherwise, what's the point of the program? It doesn't really do much. So when, you do, when you're designing your programs, you typically have a compromise that you have to choose. You have space on one hand and you have time on the other. Space and time. The two big things that are competing with each other, at least in computer science. But really, you can say the same thing about like, the world. Now, I'm not talking about space in terms of like where Mars and everything is you know, up there. I'm not talking about space in that regard. I'm talking about space in the sense of storage and amount of data that something, the amount of space that something takes. That's what I'm talking about. It turns out that when you're developing an algorithm, you know what algorithm is because you've been working on those by hand. When you're developing an algorithm to do something, a task, you know that, that involves processing data, operations on that data, but also the, you know, the data itself, right? And so the time it takes to process the data is as important as how much space the data takes to store. These are two things that you have to take into consideration, especially with data analytics, because you know, if this was a 302 class, we actually heavily focus on the time aspect, and space is more of a second thought or an afterthought. For data analytics, I, I argue that actually that's not always the case. For data analytics, I think that there is a 
much, much closer balance. I do still think that we tend to lean towards time as being the most valuable resource of the two, but space is definitely a bigger consideration than it would be in just basic data structure covers because of big data, right? We got companies like Facebook that are dealing with like petabytes of data, like insane amounts of data daily. So their space becomes a real concern. Like that's actually a real concern of like processing. So ultimately what I'm getting to with this is that when you're working with such insane amounts of data, choosing between different algorithms to do something as simple as sorting the data. So for example, let's say you want to sort massive amounts of data alphabetically. There are sorting algorithms for this. We will spend one of these days talking about sorting. I'm not really going to spend too much about actually showing you how those sorting algorithms work. You can watch my data structure videos on that to actually show you like examples of how they work and we do them by hand and everything. Here, we're just going to show you, hey, this is a sort function. Here's how you use it. Here's some basic concept about sort, that's it. Again, not the, this is not the course for that. We just want to drive the car. We don't need to learn how, we don't need to know how the car is built, right? So that's 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 kind of something that a lot of people sort of can understand. The, the sorting takes time, right? How long does sorting take in a really fast computer though? Well, nowadays with parallel computing, we are able to split the the job into multiple computers so basically we have multiple computers doing one job so we can do things a lot faster but there are limitations even within the computer as to how fast they can do something so the best sorting algorithm you know something like merge sort is going to be a time complexity of n log n with that what that number sort of means for you is that n is the number of of of, of elements or items that you're trying to sort so if we have something with a hundred items that we need to sort. And I ask you how many comparisons you have to do. What I'm talking about is when you're trying to sort a list of three numbers, that's a sorted list in descending order or what we call non-descending order because of duplicates. And if we go ahead and have it initially in this status, you know, we need to basically check to see if the list is sorted or not in the beginning. So we have to look at all the numbers see what's sorted, what's not sorted, and if something is not sorted, we need to swap it. Now, of course, we see this and we're like, well, duh, we're just gonna swap this over here, right? Yeah, because it's such a small list. Now, look at a billion different numbers and tell me if you can just look at the list in half a second and then know what to put in what spot, right? Of course, that's a lot harder to do and takes a lot of time. So, again, I'm not really showing you how the process is that you actually do the sorting, but you understand the concept that you need to move numbers around. And every time that you look at a number and you see whether that number is in the right spot or you need to swap it with another number, that takes time in a computer and we call that one operation, okay? And so, if you wanna know how many of these swaps or comparisons per se, we have to do in order to sort a list, we look at its asymptotic complexity. And it turns out that the best sorting algorithms can achieve n log n. This log is base two because binary. And so what this is saying to us is that if we have a list of 100 numbers and we feed it to something like like uh, merge sort, the time, the number of comparisons that it's gonna take is going to be n is equal to 100, so 100 times log base two of 100. Now, this is just a number you can just plug in. Uh, logarithms, if you don't remember what they are, it just means Two to what power is equal to 100? So two to some power exponent is equal to 100. So, you know, you can just plug this in the computer. It's gonna go like, it's gonna be like, I think six, but let me just triple check by typing it in. So log two of 100 is equal to 6.64. So this is equal to 6.64, three, that's enough digits, oh, nine, okay? And so ultimately what that is saying to me is that 2 to the power of 6 and, and change is going to be uh, this value. Uh, what, 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 what this really means for us is we just kind of round up. So we just say 7. And so ultimately we are going to basically say that 100 times 7 is equal to 700. So approximately this is going to take about 700 comparisons to sort a list of size 100 in this algorithm. 
There are other algorithms that are less, less efficient, such as uh, bubble sort, insertion sort, or, or quick or uh, or uh, uh, selection sort. That will take n square time. That means that if we have a hundred numbers, then they will take a thousand time, a thousand comparisons. Or actually, well, no, sorry, bigger than that. A hundred times a hundred is actually ten thousand, right? That's, that's, uh, yeah, 10,000, not 1,000. I was like, oh, that's actually really close. It's not too bad. But no, it's not that close when you think about it that way. Plus, you can see the growth rate of these numbers is going to be much higher. So whereas this, if I go and bring this up to 200, this is going to go from 7 to 8. And it's going to be 800 comparisons. Whereas here, 200 times 200, we're looking at 40,000 comparisons, right? So if you graph the growth rate of these things, squared is quadratic, right? So it's a parabola. So it's a terrible parabola, but, and you're really only looking at the positive side. I just draw it like that because it's easier. Whereas logarithmic is going to be a lot less steep than this, okay? Uh, let me, that one, let me look at the graph. Log two graph and see how steep that looks. Uh, it's gonna go all the way to about, uh, so maybe, I'll do my best here. Oops, sorry. Maybe like that. Actually, I don't think it's ever gonna. Well, whoa, whoa, what happened? The thing just went straight on me. Let's see, um, also, I don't like this. It looks, it's not the best to draw the graph. It should really. It go. For, it should go from zero here. There we go. And technically, logarithmic one is going to go like this. Yeah, that's probably a little better. I apologize that I can't draw that close enough. Okay, so th this is the logarithmic one. However, this is not just pure logarithmic. This is n times logarithmic. So that graph is the one that will be a lot trickier to see. Uh, shoot, how am I gonna look? How am I gonna make that graph? Uh, do I even want to try? See if there's one online. N log n graph. Eh, okay. So that graph looks more of like uh, it's in between the two. But I think I need to make it bigger scale to actually achieve something viable here. Something like that. Okay, and like way down here would be n, so that's like a, just a, you know one by one, just for scale purposes. And like down here beneath one is the log n. Okay, so, yeah, that's good enough. Okay, so uh, ultimately what I want to show with that is like this here is is the uh, represents the number of items in there. So the more the bigger the list that you're trying to sort, and the vertical the y-axis here is time. So you can see that the time just goes insanely fast with n squared versus n log n, not, not as bad. It's still not good, but it's not as bad, okay? So ultimately, what I'm getting to with this fanciness is that the algorithm matters. And the algorithm is going to determine how fast you can do something. So in the simplest sorting, there is a variation, okay? So that's all about the time, okay? The space is, of course, how long it takes or how much storage it takes for this. It turns out that for both of these algorithms, the merge sort and the bubble sort, it's going to practically take about the same amount of space in, in, in practical purposes. Uh, but if you're running this on parallel programming and you're, and you're splitting it into different computers, each of them has its own copy of the list or at least the section they're working on. So you might end up with a little bit of extra space required, right? So. You can see how, like, data structure side of these things, you know, the, the space isn't as relevant. Uh, however, let's look at another example other than sorting. When you're trying to access items, okay? So let's say you finish sorting this, you know, it took you whatever, a thousand. And by the way, when I say comparisons, the reason that you say comparisons and not use, like, a unit of time of seconds is because your computer is different than my computer. And my computer maybe can do the comparisons faster than yours. So it's really hard to compare whether my algorithm is better than yours if we're strictly looking at something like seconds because then the actual hardware comes into play. Like, okay, computer speed matters, right? Like, if you're running, if you, if you write a really bad algorithm and you're running it in the fastest computer in the world and I'm running, like, 
a real a really good algorithm, but I'm running it on like like a Nintendo from like the early 19, 1990s or something, then uh, yours might actually finish first. You know, of course, you know if I would say if the list is, list is big enough, I'm still going to finish first with my Nintendo. But uh, if it's a small enough list and the computer's fast enough, then you might actually beat me on that. So ultimately, that's not a good comparison. So you you you, you use compare swaps as actual the uh, the unit of measurement because that is consistent amongst all computers, and you sort of abstract the time period, the, you know, the actual seconds time from that. So even though we call it time, we're not particularly looking at seconds. We're just looking at an operation. Okay, so. And, and with space, of course, that's more practical in terms of, of number of elements. We don't care if that element is one byte or 100 bytes because it's consistent. You know, the more elements, it's a consistent increase. It's a linear increase, always. Or at least it should be. But uh, yeah, yeah, well, it should be. But there's always, there's always exceptions to the rules, right? Okay. Uh, but let me tell you an example where space actually becomes a real issue. And that's going to be relevant to what we're talking about today. Okay. So... We sorted both lists because we, we can agree that searching for an item in a sorted list is faster than searching for an item in an unsorted list, right? Because let's think about it. I have a bunch of data and I'm looking to see if the name January is found in the data, okay? If the list is unsorted, you know, I got a bunch of items and I got to look at each of every single one of them from top to bottom to find if somewhere in here is the word January. It may or may not be there. In the best case scenario, it's the first thing I'm looking at because I'm like, oh, nice, I found it. And I, I, you know, there might be other copies of it, then that's no longer best case scenario. But if you're, if you're only looking for one instance of it and it's the first one, you're good to go. Worst case scenario is one of the following. It is either the last thing you're looking for, which means you have to look at the entire list before you can find it, or it's just not found in the list at all. In which case you have to look at the entire list, literally every single element, before you could confirm that it wasn't there. Of course, another worst case scenario is if you are looking for all copies of January, because then you have to look at the entire list regardless, because there might be another copy at the end, right? So yeah. So that's searching. Of course, if you sort the list before, then we can use certain techniques to be able to access the data quicker, right? So once the list is sorted, you know that January is going to be near the beginning of the list, so you can start at the beginning, right? But rather than doing some weird hacks like that, there's actually algorithms that allow you to search faster. There's an algorithm that is known as binary search. Again, it's not something that I'm going to cover in detail, but I just want to make you aware of it because it will serve a purpose. And what binary search is, is how you find something in a dictionary. So when you have a book and you need to find a specific page in the book, what do you do? You open the book somewhere on the middle and you see if you're close. You know, if you're looking for a, for, a, for a word in a dictionary like cat and you open the dictionary and you're at the letter H, you automatically know that, you know, and let's say it's around the middle of the dictionary, you automatically know that anything after this page cannot have the word cat because cat is before it. So you can discard that. So already from like a, a thousand page dictionary, if you're opening it at like page 400, you know that it's on the first 400 pages. So you've already cut your search amount by half. Do it again. You know, you, you, you kind of open the other, the, of, the, of, the, of the remaining half on the left, you open it again. And now you're back to, you're down to like 100 pages. And now maybe you are at the word D. So like dog. So then you're like, okay, it's, it cannot be on this chunk. It has to be in the beginning chunk. And you keep doing that. And the reason for doing that is because you're, every time you do it, if you do it exactly at the middle, which we don't, but we kind of do, you are cutting the, the amount of pages you got to look in half each time. So if you start on half of half of half of half, that's your logarithm, and that's basically how long it's going to take. So no surprise, to find an item in a sorted list, it takes log in time. So if you got a book with 100 pages, and, you're, so, and it's equal to 100, and you're trying to find an, an item in there, it's going to take approximately, uh, it's sorry, seven comparisons because it's going to be 6.6, .6, but you know you round it up to seven. So in seven, in seven comparisons, only seven, you can find something. If you're literally looking at the half of the half of the half of the half, maybe plus one at the end to confirm that it's not found if it's not found. Okay, but you will know because the list is sorted. If the list is unsorted then there's no magical way to actually 
find the data immediately. You have to look at every single item. You could split it among some different computers to search for it separately if you have such big data, but you still have to look at every single item. So the time complexity of that is going to be n time, which means the length of the list. If you got 100 numbers or 100 elements in the list, you have to look at 100 of them and you have to do 100 comparisons. 100 versus 7, which one do you want? Of course, you want the smaller one. It's a much faster retrieval process. If you're calling the, what well, 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 this doesn't exist anymore, but back in the day when you would call like the 400 number or whatever it was for like the operator or whatever, and you'd be like, can you find me the phone number to this business? You know, it costs money to call, right? Per minute. So you want them to find it immediately, right? Or if you're Googling something, you want the results back now, not in an hour after they finish searching to the entire massive internet. So you want this to, to be given to you immediately, right? And so, one of the ways that you can speed it up is sorting, and it works, it's login, it's fast, but it's not immediate. So login of a billion is still a relatively large number. Not as large as a billion would be if it was linear, but it's still not instant. And we want things instantly. When I hit enter on Google, I get the results instantly. And Google's pretty darn big that even login would be pretty slow. So what do they do? Well. They use hashing and hashing is dictionaries. And that's one of the biggest, better types of Python that we're going to look at. So, and that's actually one of them. I think the, of the ones that I have there, the most interesting. So what is hashing? Hashing is going to allow you to make things faster than even binary search. The way hashing works is a little bit tricky to understand for, uh, you know, in general. So I'm going to give you a very sort of strange but ideal example and then work from there. Okay. Since we're talking about operators and whatnot, let's talk about phone numbers. You know, they're calling to find out a phone number. So one of the ways that you can store the information and access it quickly is if you store all the phone numbers, you know, you might not have, you might have some phone numbers that are in use, some are not. You could sort them all numerically and you could search with login, but it's still not ideal. So I propose to do the following system to you. Let's make a massive list. And by massive, I mean massive. It's going to be a list that is going to contain one billion dollars, like Mr. Evil. Now, one billion phone numbers in it, okay? so. It's going to contain 1 billion phone numbers. And there's a reason I picked this specific number. It has nothing to do with Mr. Evil. Or maybe it does, but I wouldn't tell you. So the reason why is because if I do this, then I can make an index for every phone number that exists. So for example, if I'm looking at phone number 0, which is in the real number, then yeah, there's nothing going to, nothing's going to really be there. In fact, nothing's going to be there until we get at least to the, uh, like, well, I'm assuming there can't be any leading zeros in phone numbers. So I guess a real phone, the first real phone number, which would be a pretty cool, actually, oh, no, we're missing actually one more digit, right? Yeah, yeah, we're missing one more digit. So it's not one billion dollars, it's 10 billion phone numbers, okay? <laughs> and then I guess the first valid phone number would be... Uh, would be that, that which would be basically uh, number one billion. Okay, so really we have a variation of nine billion numbers that we can store. The first billion are kind of empty, but that's okay, all right? So somewhere in here we got that number, so I'm just gonna say one B for one billion. Uh, and then, you know, all the way at the end here, we have the number um, 99999, nine, 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 right? Because we started from zero. So 9999. Nine, nine, nine. That'd be a cool phone number to have, right? So, yeah. So 9 billion, 999 million, 999,999. Okay? And so somewhere in here, we have 702, 895. Gee, I, I, I was going to put a random 895 number because that's a UNLV code, but. Uh, that might be somebody's phone number, and maybe if I D dog, you know, DOS him. So maybe we'll just do uh, one 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 zero zero one zero or one one. Okay, yeah, <laughs> it's gonna be like like the thing that happened with the Squid Game, where the number in the in the show 
with a real phone number. Well, they, they, they put a random number, but it turned out to be a real phone number. And that person got called by like 15,000 people. And yeah, not fun. <laughs> so yeah, I don't want to do that. Although that'd be kind of cool if 15,000 people saw this video, but yeah. You might all decide to call the number that I put here, so yeah. It's still one too many calls for some poor person. So, okay. So, you know, the point is that by doing this, I have an index for every valid number that could ever exist. And so if this was my phone number, then I could say, well, here, this doc is, you know, or like, you know, we have another phone number somewhere for Rick. You know, it might be 702-111. This one's like 8811. Here's Rick and so on, right? So like you could have all valid phone numbers here. And now if I call in and say, hey, whose phone number is seven? Can you look up this number? And then they give you 702-111-0011. When you're writing your, your, your Python code, because this is just some massive list that's just called phones, it's just some massive list like that, then you can literally just say phones and then throw it in. Say like 702-111-0011 as the index. And immediately, because Python indexing will get you back something immediately, it'll immediately give you back my name. No searching required, no processing time. This is what... in Asymptotic complexity is known as O of 1 or just O of constant time because it will basically give it back to you immediately. Why does that work? Because we are using the indexing and how things are stored in memory as the actual number that we're looking up. So it's like a little hack that we're doing per se. That's what's known as a hash table. So we're, we've essentially hashed the values. Here's the downside with this. Of the 10 billion numbers out here, Maybe, how many people do we have in the US? Like 300, 350 million or something? So let's say we have 400 million, okay? We have 10 billion possible numbers. Well, actually we have 9 billion because the first billion are not really working out because they're leading zeros, but that's fine. Let's just say we, we could do that too. We're not even using a tenth of that. We're using like one, like less than, the, than like 1 20th of the numbers available, okay? Or actually maybe, you know, but that's assuming that each person has one phone number, but companies and everything. We might actually be using more than that now that I think about it. But uh, whatever. In the in the in the craziest case that we had like a lot, we're still using under 20% of the numbers, okay? So the other six eighty percent of numbers are just blanks. Like, you know, you look up number like let's just say the number nine 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 is not owned by anyone, so we just put like a none here. So then you ask, who owns that number? They're going to be like, well, that's no no one, okay? And so you fill the other ones with like a none in there. So, you know, this is fast, and this will literally give you the fastest time complexity. So, so you have developed something that can achieve like amazing time, but at what cost? You have to make this massive list where you're not even using it. You're using only about, a, you know, less than a quarter of the, of the space of it. The other is, is completely wasted space, but you're doing it at the sac you're sacrificing that space at the benefit of time. And again, time is the more valuable one typically, uh, most of the cases, except with big data. With big data, you might want to compress data, uh, and compressing the data saves space, but then you have to uncompress it before you access it. Such as like when you go and download a data set from the internet, like from Kegel or something. You go in there and you download it, and it's a zip file. And the zip file might be, uh, you know, one gigabyte. But when you uncompress it, it's seven gigabytes. And you're like, whoa, what happened? Well, compression is using mathematical formulas to basically try to find patterns in the numbers, of, in the binary numbers in the file, or hex file, or the hex numbers, to essentially try to, to shrink it down. And that's what happens, and that's, that's how they do it. Sometimes it works better than other cases. A lot of the times when it comes to text, it's very easy to find patterns for computers, not for us, like that, like to that level at least be pretty impressive if somebody could compress something, you know, to the level of a computer within their own lifetime, like just for one zip file. <laughs> there should be a lot of computations to figure that out. But, uh, oh, you know, for example, one of the data sets that I, that I, that I was, that I'm working on, uh, it went from four gigabytes to 300 megabytes with compression. It's just incredible, like amazing. At the cost of when I unzip it, it's gonna take a while to unzip. That's, an, that's, that's a scenario where I valued space over time because, you know, at the end of the day, 
it's going to take longer to download. It, 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 you know, I say that. I say space over time. But ultimately, it was about time because, like, think about it. Download speed of 4 gigabyte file is going to take maybe 5 minutes. But on compressing a file, it takes 1 minute. So if I shrink the file to 300 megabytes where it takes less than a minute to download, even if I have to add another minute to the uncompression time, it's still going to be faster than if I had uploaded a bigger file. So that's one benefit. That it's space, but it's really about the time. But I could also say, well, you know, cost money and like, let's say that it's such a massive data set that like, you know, with all the data limits that like Cox and all these companies put on us, like you you know, have a data limit of like, oh yeah, you can only download one terabyte a month or recharge your money. Then you might be like, oh, okay, I'd rather like uncompress the file locally and spend time doing that and not like hit my data cap in a month because of downloading a massive data set. So I'd rather like have it compressed. So, you know, it's a good compromise. That's truly a thing where like you care more about uh, space because your data limits. Okay. So what I'm getting to with all of this is that space does come into play but typically it tends to buy a source time and in the case of hash tables it's all about the time and not about the space this is actually has a special name though because it has every possible number in there it's known as a direct access table and direct access tables are cool because they're they're really guaranteed to give you that constant time but it is kind of overkill to use so much space because like sure these are just names and it's not going to take a lot but imagine you're keeping like massive profiles for each phone number here this would grow fast like huge really fast so is there a compromise you know we don't want to go with the sorted stuff because that's still slow but we do like to have this and yes there is a compromise and that's where really hashing comes into play so there's no what's known as a hash function so when you're talking about hashing you have to understand the hash function so what the hash function does is it basically takes information that you're trying to store as the index and first of all it converts it to a number if it's not already a number because I mean you know here it just happened to be again this was why I said it's kind of a special example because phone numbers are numbers already so it kind of just fit perfectly for this but let's say that you are trying to store something that is not a number this could be a mixture of data like strings and letters and numbers and other data, you still need to convert this into some sort of indexing system that you can quickly use here. And then, of course, you need to be able to convert it back to what it, the original data was too. So, again, I'm not going to go too in depth about how hash tables work, the, the different methods for hashing and and uh, you know collision resolution and things like that, but to try to give you the quickest version of this, and again, you can watch my Trio 2 videos if you want to know in depth about that, is uh, that when you're hashing, what you're doing is you're simplifying the value into something smaller. So for example, let's say that we only used, so we, we keep a much smaller table that contains only 10,000 numbers, in it, zero to 10,000. And we're only going to be using the last three digits or sorry, the last four digits of the phone number as a location on that list of 10,000, okay? That will work because now we're not, you know, we have a much smaller list. But if there are two phone numbers that have the same last four digits, those two items are going to try to go to the same spot. So if we have a, if somebody whose number is, is, is 725-111-0011, so like, 725-111-011. This person is going to end up in the same list as the uh, as, as me. So this is like uh, Jane. Okay. So Jane's gonna end up in the, with the same with the same location as me. So if somebody asks for that, they're gonna be like, ah, uh, it could be either Jane or Doc. And you're gonna be like, oh, what? I only want the right person. Yeah, but what you can do is not just instead of just storing my name, store my number with that. So then, you know, sure you gotta look to two items, you can use at that point just a linear search, but you're only looking at two numbers. And so that's a, that's what's known as a collision, and you ideally wanna keep the least amount of collisions possible, uh, but if you do, it, you're gonna be limited at a few checks, so it's still gonna be much better than, 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 uh, than doing the log end stuff. And of course, 
trying to make things hash in an even way is not as easy as here where again that you just pick the last four digits you have to use special functions a lot of math involved fanciness that will allow you to to run to the evenly distribute data once you hash it but it has to be deterministic which means that if i feed the word mario into a hash function and it returns that it should go on address 5 index 5 then it should always do that. So if I feed Mario tomorrow, it should always go back to five. So you don't lose access to the data. That's what's deterministic is known as. It has to be balanced, which means that like if I feed Mario, if I feed Mario with like two O's at the end, it should be a completely different spot. It shouldn't have locality in the sense that like, well, this is close enough to Mario. So you're going to get like plus one on the address. You don't want that for security purposes and also for balancing purposes because you want the data to evenly be distributed so you end up with like a table that is nicely balanced with data you don't want to end up in a situation where you have a lot of data here that's really tight to the point that there's a lot of collisions and then nothing over here that's poor balancing it means you need a better hash function so a lot of things go into play with this but ultimately that's what a hash function is so now now that i told you all the science behind of this let me tell you how you can use it in Python and how it helps you. Because again, you want to be able to have this quick access time. And that's what ultimately you're going to be using this for. So for that quick access time. It's going to be much faster than the list. It might take a little more space, but Python has a really good hash functions to, to handle all that behind the scene magic so that things are balanced. So don't worry too much about that and just use them when you want to because it will speed up your program a lot. Okay? So I know that was basically 36 minutes of, 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 of technical stuff, but I do think that in the long term, it is going to benefit you to know that, at least for, for, uh, for, for things like choosing between the list and the dictionary, because there it matters that you understand them. So that, like, let me give you a very, very quick example. When I was doing data analytics for the Alzheimer data, like, you know, I was doing a lot of tables and moving things around, and uh, I initially started with code that took about five minutes to run. And between the magic of hashing, dictionaries, sets, and all the right data structures, I brought it down to like something like five seconds. So from, 30, from, from five minutes to five seconds, basically. Like that's an insane optimization just on doing that. And sure, I changed a, lot, a little bit of code here and there, but the majority of the optimization, I'm not gonna lie, came from using the right data structure. Why well, didn't do that at the beginning? Because I'm a firm believer that when you code, you you want to you don't want to optimize too early on in the process. You want to prototype your code. Of course, start by paper. But once you're actually coding, write what you just prototype. Don't overthink optimizing piece of code until it works the first time. Once you have a prototype working, that's when you gotta be like, okay, what do I get? What do I remove from this? What do I add to this? What do I do just to get this going? And once you have that working, now you're like, okay, what can I remove from this and still make this good? Don't add features, remove features at that point, make it as lean as possible, but only after it's working. And finally, after you are happy and you showed it to others and everything is good, then you optimize it. Because otherwise, this happens to everybody. You write this piece of code and as you're writing it, you're like, oh, I really wanna optimize to make this amazing hardcore thing work really smooth and fast. And you spend so long on it. And then like when you finally finish it and you go on to the next thing, you're like, oh shoot, this doesn't work. I have it set up. I either have to change it or worse yet, you're like, oh snap, I don't need this anymore. So it's, just, it's useless. At that point, you don't even want to delete it. You're like, I don't want to delete this. I spent two days on this. Like, like, can I use it in some way or form or at least leave it there so people see that I did this really piece of, cool piece of code? And that's just shameful. We're all guilty of doing that one way or another at some point. Take it as a learning experience so you don't do it again. Don't optimize too early in the game. You're not going to impress anybody, and you're just going to waste time. And time, as we saw, is one of the two major things that we have, right? Space and time. In our life, if time is limited, don't waste it optimizing things you're going to end up deleting at the end of the day, probably. So don't optimize too early. Okay? So um, same with the analytics, by the way. Don't go crazy with the optimization. Okay. So like I said, Let's start out by showing you um, lists and then go into dictionaries. So with lists, you know, I, I just want to point out a couple of things. And that is that, again, you can insert 
into a list into a specific index so lists are indexed okay so let's write that in so lists are indexed so they're ordered meaning that when you insert something in a specific spot it always stays in that spot as in like if i run a for loop i know what order to expect things in and i can access at any time any item like that i am able to mutate it so it's mutable so you can go ahead and insert items at any time and remove items at any time um i don't remember if i show you how to remove things in there so um let's uh let's just give you some examples of that so for example you know if, if you want to remove an item that you're looking for so like let's say you have the numbers uh you have a list it has one two three and you want to remove the number two then you can say l dot remove and pass the value too now if these are strings so like if they are strings like that then make sure you put strings here okay otherwise things will not match so you can remove that way of course you know how to append you just do l append you know like four and that's going to insert it at the end of the list that's what append literally stands for okay uh, you can also remove a specific item from that list by using uh, pop as well. So you can say all pop, and then you can just pass the index. So if I say zero here, it's going to pop the first number. So that's the one. Okay. So pop is very cool. Uh, I'll leave a I'll leave a reference to uh, the schools that has a bunch of examples to uh, allow you to, uh, to to see some some of these as well and remember them. There's also clear. So for example, if I do l clear, l clear. <laughs> Uh, that will empty the list basically just delete everything from the list um, you can also use delete which would just kill the list entirely there's some probably maybe garbage collection um, you can also remove uh, items from a list with delete so I, I would rec discourage you from doing this I don't like the syntax but if you say delete l2 it's going to delete the third item off the list okay so you can do that way but again i discourage you from doing it that way okay um of course you can use the ant indexes to change things and insert yeah let's do insert insert is a good one so let's say you want to insert a specific uh index of the list okay so you can just say l dot insert and then you have two parameters the second parameter is what you want to insert so like let's say you want to insert the, you know, the letter x in there and then the first parameter is the index that you're inserting at so this will be inserting it at index one okay uh it is important to understand that with insert you are not replacing a value you're inserting it in that spot and things are shifting forward so if you have you know one two three in here and you call insert on that then the resulting list should be one. Uh, I believe you will see one, one, two, three. Let me, triple, let me just triple check it. Yeah, okay. I just want to make sure that it didn't put it afterwards. But yeah, it'll put it before. So before, so before index one was literally the two. So it shifts the two forward and puts the one there, okay? So that's with enter. Of course, if you just want to replace what you're inserting, then just, you know, you can just do like L2 gets high or something, okay? Uh, oh, wait, 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 wait. You don't insert a one here. You insert the X, because that's what we're inserting. So sorry for that. Uh, and if you do this to that, then now your list is going to be one, x and then i guess high and then uh three right because that's replacing it so if you want to replace you just use the index operators there if you want to insert you use that uh, the last one that i forgot to show the other day when i was doing list comprehension and stuff is that if you went to uh it's called slicing i believe if you want to slice a list it's like take a piece of it and then print that piece out or something so if i say like print and in here I say L and then I say like uh, zero to one, something like that. What that's going to do is it's going to only take starting from element zero and then it's going to, uh, 
take the uh, uh, just one actually because it will not do the last one so right yeah yeah Sl slicing will not do the last one so maybe zero one and two yeah yeah so for example if I do just to, to give you an idea let's just do one three here if you do one three there it's going to basically uh, the new list you're gonna get out of this is going to be X which is in spot one high which is in spot two and that's it you're not gonna get the three because that's it doesn't include three okay so slicing is nice if you want to cut the beginning of a list or the end if you don't want to you can do that and then it's just going to slice all the first three items of the list so that will include the one in there uh, vice versa if you want to take piece of a list from the beginning and on so you can see like from one and on then it's going to take from the first and on so it's going to take all these afterwards but not including the one uh, or again you can combine it like that and then it's just going to take one item there which is the one uh, slicing is cool for when you're just you know you could use this with list comprehension as well but uh, the big the big cool thing about it is that you can uh, you can make new lists on the fly that only include parts of your list uh, for whatever purpose you might want to do. Okay, so anyways, that's all about list. So moving on to part two dictionaries Okay, so with dictionaries You have the idea of the value that you're hashing and then this the value that you're storing Okay, and so we tend to use the the term key and values for that Okay, so key is like your phone number and value is the name of the person that is at that phone number. So you use the key to access the value. So think of a key, you know, to open the door. You need the key to get the value. And so uh, the, the first thing that I should tell you about dictionaries is that unlike lists, they do not allow duplicate keys, okay? So a dictionary is going to be, you're gonna find things based on the key. So whereas with, you, you, you can think about a list. With a list, when you look at an index five, there's only one index five. So there's technically no duplicates in list either in that sense. Like there's no duplicate indices. There can be duplicate content, but not indices. There's only one indice per, per, per like index, you know, like L5 is gonna to return to me the sixth element and that's it. Like there's no two of them, right? There might, I mean, the sixth element could be a bunch of stuff in there. You got a list in there for all, for, you know, if you're thinking like 2D or 3D list, but it's still just gonna be one location. You can think of that sort of same concept with dictionaries, but the difference here is that instead of using an index, you're using a value, which is the key, which is going to be hashed behind the scenes. And so you only want one value to be hashed, you know, to, to, to the same location. So it has to only be one item. So that's why they can't be duplicates there, okay? So no, you can have duplicate values, such as if like two people have the same name with different, with different phone numbers, that's okay, but not two phone numbers that have connected to two different people. It's like one phone number, one person, end of the day, right? Uh, if you wanna have multiple phone numbers to one person, or sorry, multiple persons to one phone number, then they have to be living like, they have to be together so that it's still one location. It cannot be like different locations in the table. And so that's the first sort of important thing to understand that is there's no duplicates with dictionaries. So if you intend to have duplicates, then dictionaries is not the way to go. Uh, they are they are mutable or changeable, so that means that you can add, remove, you know, insert, remove at any time a uh, a key and a value pair from the dictionary. Let me write the words key and value here. So key, oh, well, beneath because it's a new section. So you have a key and value pair. Okay, so you, they're changeable. Uh, no duplicates. And uh, this one's this one's brand new. Uh, well, not that brand new, but somewhat new within recent years. They are technically ordered, which is similar to a list that like things are ordered. So when you create them, that is the order that they're going to be in. Uh, the reason that I say kind of technically is because this only applies if you have Python 3.7 or newer. Whereas if you have Python 
are ordered, like two or whatever, then they are unordered. So just something to keep in mind. Hopefully you are using a new Python, but you know, sometimes like I was using the other day, the PyWin library, it's not available for, uh, for PyWin32 library. It's not available for, for, uh, for, for Python 3.10, which is the newest iteration of Python as of this video. So uh, I had to, I, I think I downloaded 3.8 uh, and it's just to use it. 3.8, 3.9, I can't remember. Um, so, you know, it is possible that you may run into a library that is only available for Python 3.6. Maybe it hasn't been updated in the last few years. And so, you know, you, you, you go and download Python 3.6 and then uh, you run it and then you're using a dictionary and you forget that it's unordered and then uh, you try to iterate through it and it's coming back in different orders and can cause some problems, right? So that's why it's kind of important to know that it, it, you know, it, that's something that changed. I think it's good that it's ordered now, by the way. I do like that. I, I, I think that's cool. So I respect it for uh, changing that. Okay, so let us go ahead and make a very simple dictionary then, okay? And uh, go from there. So, what are we gonna do for dictionary? Um, let's go ahead and just do random words, okay? So, we are going to say that each word represents a username of someone, okay? Just an example. So, just like any other, variable in uh, Python, you just pick an identifier for it. So, you know, I'm going to call this like the uh, ICT for dictionary. And when you create a dictionary, the first thing you'll notice is that that's for a list, the square brackets. And for dictionaries, you are going to be using curly braces. However, when you do make curly braces, uh, there's another of the data structures that we'll cover today that is a curly braced one, and that's a set. But I believe if you just put curly braces, it'll default to dictionary. Whereas with a set, you actually want to actually write the word set. So we'll, we'll get there at some point. Maybe not today, based on it took a while. But we'll at the next video, okay? So yeah, just, just be aware of that. that. That's how you create an empty dictionary, okay? Uh, once you create an empty dictionary, you can start inserting things into the dictionary. Uh, but before that, let me show you how to make a dictionary that already contains some things in it. You know, with the, with the list, you just, you know, put the things in there and call it a day. Uh, with dictionary, it's a little bit different because you have this key value pair concept. So, for example, let's say we have the word car. So, somebody's username is car. You put it in quotes like this. I believe it's single or double. won't really matter. You put a colon. And then on this side, you're gonna put what the value of that is. And these doesn't have to be strings, they could be numbers or they can be objects once we learn about those, anything. But in this case, we are just going to say, uh, you know, a car and, a, and Tony or something, okay? Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. If you wanna put multiples, you, you comma separate them. So let's say that we have somebody's other username who is like uh, uh, Mario. And the real name is Claire. Come on, I'm just coming up with names as they come. They look kind of strange. There we go. Um, and so on. When you finally finish, yeah, let's do one more that actually sorts different data. So let's just say somebody else's nickname is maple I was gonna say Apple but <laughs> I already wrote M from I was thinking Mac and Apple so I guess I came up with Mac maple and then I forgot to put a second P so that's usually how most people come up with their online names and just kind of think of random stuff and yeah stuff happens let's say that they are going to be uh, I'm trying to like uh, let's see Ed let's do Ed okay Oh, wait, no, 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 sorry. I wanted to do something other than, let's say that in this case, for some reason, this person's real name is actually a number. Uh, like they're Elon Musk's kid or something. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll just do their, their 588. Okay? So, 
when you finish, you can put a comma, but in this case, it's the last one, so we don't put a comma, just like with the list, we don't put a comma after the last item, and then you can just close your curly brace in this case. So just dump it there. Of course, it could all be in one line, but you know, it's nicer to make it like this. And there you go. If you want to print your dictionary, then you can just go ahead and do print and print dictionary, and it'll print it out pretty cool like that. Actually, no, no, not quite. Um, when you print a dictionary out by just calling it like this, um, oh, no, 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 I, I take that back. It'll print it out. It'll actually print it out pretty much in the same format that you see it here, just one line. So with the colons and the commas and the curly braces, okay? So that's cool, but the, you know, it's kind of weird. I don't actually ever really initialize a dictionary like this. Um, I just kind of insert things on their way. So for example, let me show you how you would normally do a dictionary. So you just create a dictionary. So we'll just call this one to shorthand uh, A. And if I want to insert something in there, I simply say A, and then I use square brackets, and I say what I want to insert. So let's just say we want to, let's say that we're going to make a dictionary of names and they're going to associate to numbers, kind of like the, the squid, squid game. So I don't remember any of their names though, because they're Korean, so nah, I'm not very good with those names. So uh, let's, let's just say that the name was Timmy and they were player 55. So over here, you can store 55. And so this is your key and this is your value. And again, these are these could be a lot of, they could, you could put a list in here, by the way. The, the value could be an entire list of data, but uh, we're just doing a basic example. And so when you do that, there are two things can happen. One of them is if this, if this key value, if this key does not exist in the dictionary, it'll just add it in, it'll add the key in the value pair. What could also happen is, let's say that in here, you know, where we're doing something with the existing dictionary, and I went ahead and said, um, Dick Maple gets hello. If I do that, let's move this down a little bit so I have space. Then in this case, that key already exists. So you won't get an error or anything of that sort. It'll simply overwrite the key. So now when I print this again, you know, it'll print this out instead, or print a hello instead of 588, okay? So that's all there's to it, to a dictionary. Um, I think for the rest of the stuff, we can probably just do it on the computer, because I do want to play around with this, and maybe make a massive list. And don't worry, the other ones we won't spend as long on. The dictionary is the one that I wanted to spend the most amount of time, just because it's the one that you will find yourself probably using the most. Uh, although I, with the optimization, I use sets a lot too. The one I barely ever use is tuples. I just don't, uh, I don't buy with them, I guess. It's not my thing. But uh, yeah, so let's, uh, hmm. let's make a, let's make a for loop that makes a massive dictionary, okay? And that massive dictionary is going to be, let's do some random generation. Oh, this might get a little too ambitious. Uh, I'm trying to, to, to think of what would be nice to do. Okay, all right, so. Let us make, again, this is when you would do this by paper to plan it ahead. Uh, so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be creating a list of, list of, of key pairs, uh, key values, where the key is going to be a randomly generated word. And then I am going to take that word and I'm going to associate it to another randomly generated word. And that's going to be my key pair. And the reason I want to do that is because then I want to show you how quicker that is if you run it for a lot of times versus running it with the list. Okay, so it's a bit ambitious of an example to do within the next 15 minutes, but we will do our best to try. So 
see if there's a uh, random word generator in Python that uh, can save me some time. Ah, perfect. So there is a dictionary file somewhere. Let's see if it'll work. So this is from Stack Overflow. I'll leave the link at the description below. I just Googled random. Uh, what did I Google? I Googled random word generator Python. And uh, I found somebody saying that you can just pull the local list of dictionaries. Um, so there's a couple of options, but yeah, we'll see if this one works. So they claim that, and this, I mean, this makes sense. I do recall I was using at some point this dick thing here. So I do think we'll be okay. So this in theory should pull out, uh, open up a file. Uh, with a bunch of dictionary words. And then I can just randomly pick from this. So I don't want to print out the entire thing because it's going to be massive. So what I'm going to do is just to see if this works is I'm going to print out the length of this list. Uh, oh, sorry, but I got, I got to say this somewhere. So I'm going to call this word list. And this is better term than word. It's probably going to be uh, the location. Yeah. I could have also literally just put this in here. In fact, screw it. I'm just going to do that. Let's see. Uh, let's see if this works. Oh yeah, it worked. We got 102,000 words in there. Beautiful. Okay. So we can just use those to randomly generate the pairs. Okay. So now. I'm going to start out by making a, a variable that's going to be, uh, remember the other program, we just used it from the user. So we'll go with that same approach. So we'll say size is equal to, uh, or we'll say D size for dictionary size is going to be whatever the user inputs. Uh, how many words? And then, oh yeah, that's a string. So we want to make it into an integer. So wrap around int tags like that to cast it and now we're going to say for x in d size so this is going to run x amount of times uh, which is the size amount of times and so now let's just go ahead and make a dictionary so first we want to declare outside of the loop so let's call a dictionary uh, dictionary and make it empty and in here we are going to say dictionary of the word x or sorry not word x uh, we want to pick a random word to throw in there. So let's generate our words ahead of time. So we're going to call it the key and the V for value. And the key is going to be a randomly picked word from that. So let's import random for that. And now we're going to say random rand integer and range including both endpoints so from zero through d size minus one because i don't want to go out of bounds so that'll pick anything they'll pick a letter from the entire range of letters uh, oh sorry a word from the entire range so when i ran length there it's somebody's 102,000. so that means i can pick anywhere from word zero to 100 to word 102,400, not 401 because it's the size array start from zero right indexing and so that's why I'm saying D size minus one here. Um, you know, is that minus one going to be inefficient? You know, to, to, to make this extra efficient, I'm going to make another variable and call it uh, uh, R, like, just like my range or whatever. And I'm going to make D size minus one there because that, you know, it might, I, I think Python's smart enough to realize that it just needs to do that, but I don't know if it will. So by, by doing this, I am going to remove one extra operation that might need to happen like twice every time this loops. And because we want to run this with like a really big number, I don't want to, to slow it down unnecessarily. Okay. So, okay. So now that we did that, we can say that is going to be the key and that's going to be the value. And in theory, that is going to be good to go. Uh, there might be some overlaps. I mean, in theory, like we could have the same word we pulled twice from the pool. But if it does, it's just going to override it, okay? So after we do all of that, uh, I would like to see how big my dictionary is, which should in theory be the same size as the loop, right? Unless something got replaced. So 
so I am going to just print that out because I'm curious. And uh, for now, I'm going to print out a dictionary, but I'm going to disable that later because I want to print out a billion different things. Okay. So that's my that's my code. I'm going to run it once. How many words? Just to do ten for now. Uh, what happened? Int object is not iterable. Int object is not. Oh, yikes! That's a number, so it should say in range. Here we go. Dang it! Ten. Okay, so we can see here that we got. Uh, oh, that doesn't feel right. Oh shoot! We're picking random here. We're not. Sorry, this is picking a random number as it should. But that random number that we pick is going to be the index of the size that we want to insert. So I got to add this in there. Run it again. Ten words. Int object is not subscriptable. Again, I did not mean to put the size there. I meant to put the word list. Sorry, it is now 3 a.m. I keep making more videos. I can't stop. It's just too fun to write like on code. Okay. All right. AOL, AWS, AMD. Why are we getting these random AOL? Okay. Let's try to run it again. I'm curious if this is just like weird luck. That's suspicious. We're getting a bunch of A's in there. Is this giving us different numbers? You know, that's, that's, that's something's wrong there because, uh, Yes. Ah, okay. Ah, definitely. Definitely. I should stop teaching after this one. This is the size of the list. So what we need to be putting in here is the size minus one, not the size. So that was the issue. Um, okay. Now we should be okay. All right. So... There we go. This looks more random now. So we have this, we have this, we have this. So these are all the key pairs. So we got aquas and the pair is value. The value is Kislev. We have Montana, Seasides. We have modeling, customize, uh, and so on. Hopefully we don't get weird profanity in here. I didn't think about that. Uh, if we do, then that's literally like the random RNG gods communicating with us here. <laughs> because what are the odds? Uh, okay. So this works fine. Um, just to you know, test it out once we finish it. We'll print an excerpt of it. So we'll say like, uh, let's, can, can we do list comprehension with the dictionary? I don't, uh, we could try. We'll see if it works. Uh, X for X in, oh, ooh, no, but, no, yeah, yeah, we'll, okay, so we do, we'll, we'll do range trace for it, because I don't want to iterate through every single item. We just want to iterate through a couple of them. So we'll select like 10 of them. Uh, and then here, what we're printing is actually X um, of that index. Wait, mm, no, that's not gonna work because the index. Yeah, that won't work. Okay, screw that. Uh, what we'll do is just a for loop. So it's for I in range 10. We will just print out a couple of these. How do we get the words though? Um, I'm trying to say how, how we're gonna get a couple of keys from, well, we can get one key. Sure, we'll get at least one key. We'll get the last key that K has, assuming that, that it's still in memory. We can do that. And that'll at least print out one of the keys. So if I say this, We'll get one of them. And notice that we're only getting the value of that key. So if we want to print out the value, the key itself, then we would also need to print out K like that. So like that, okay? So this is actually the key and this is the value. It just looks flips here. In fact, here I'll flip it just for you. Okay. So now that we got this code running, uh, let's go ahead and time it. Okay, and then we can see, you know, how long it would take 
to find something linearly or to to yeah to to find it linearly okay so this here is a simple search we're doing okay so like we're gonna make a, a million different values, and then we're just going to search for this one. It's just it's just the last one, sure, but it's technically somewhere in the list. It's not at the end of the list. It's just somewhere, okay? And uh, I would like to see, you know, to show you how big I can make that, but still, it'll run pretty fast. So let us try to run it first. Let's just baby steps. Let's do ten thousand numbers first. You can see it finishes pretty much instantly, okay? Let's do one million. I'll escalate it quickly. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000. About eight, about eight seconds. Well, I kind of kind of quickly there. Seven seconds to search a million words. Okay, a million words. How long would it take to search through a million different words in a list? Let's do that. Uh, let's do that in a different file though. So let's take some of this code, the RNG stuff. And here, the only difference we're gonna make is instead of a dictionary, I'm gonna make a list. I'm gonna call that just L. And then I'm going to generate those. Um, although, well, I'll, I'll generate them and I'll store them together because I don't really have a nice and easy way of uh, well, here, I'll just, uh, I'll comment this one out, and I'll make it even simpler here. I'm only going to insert half the, half the data, because I'm only going to insert one of the words. And the way I'm going to insert it, I'm going to say l.append k. Okay? Okay. Okay, and then in here for the print, I'm going to have to use a built-in function from Python called, I think there's a, what is it, find? Search, uh, what's, what's a nice search function? I can use in. Uh, yeah, okay. So I think I can say like print if k in l, okay? So, or why am I like? Oh, okay, no, it's just K and L. That should print out true because, like, what we're searching is we're searching for the last thing that was inserted. Sure, it's at the end of the list, but um, yeah, I don't like that it's at the end of the list. Maybe this will optimize it and search at the end. Maybe it will. Maybe it won't. We'll see. We'll see. Okay, but let's go ahead and try this with the, with a million and see. Well, let's try it with 100,000 and see where, or 10,000 first and see what happens, okay? So let's do 10,000. It ended up immediately, okay? Let's do 1 million now. Did I get too many zeros in there? It's kind of hard to see right now. There we go, 1 million. 1,000, 2,000. 3,000, 4,000. Ah, oh, I finished faster. Wow. <laughs> Gosh, he's, Python's letting me down right now. The, the list version <laughs> finished fast. <laughs> okay. Um, let's pick a random number for both of these cases instead of this. So maybe we'll do one that says like, uh, if K is equal to like, I don't know, 50,000. No, like 600,000. That's the one we're going to keep, okay? So we're, we're going to put in the value called uh, Z. So I'm going to store Z in there, okay? So Z gets K, and now I'm going to do print Z, okay? And now I'm going to do the same thing for the other one. And I'm going to use a different way of timing it, because this thing is not nice with me here. So Z and K. C and L. All right. So let me open up the terminal and let me go ahead and type in Python uh, 
three wait oh, hold on cd desktop da621 there we go so we have python 3 17.py that's one of them and we're gonna use a little thing called time here that we tap at the front of the code that we're running we do that and then we put in our six million so six one two three one two three trace back k is not defined ah yeah you are not wrong python you are not wrong Okay, so we are going to go ahead and put in 6 million here. And we don't need to count it ourselves because this will actually give us a time when it finishes. It will tell us how long it actually really took. So we can see that about 15 seconds. Okay, 18. Let's make sure we are putting 6 million here. And let's see how long that one takes. Loki, I'm hoping that it finishes faster, but this one crashed. Z is not defined. Oh, I forgot to put C out here. Okay. One, two, three. One, two, three. All right. Again, we're trying to beat about 14 seconds. That finished faster. You see, there's no locality going on here. It's playing tricks on me. Python's doing some optimization to this. I bet you. Or maybe we have to go to bigger numbers. Why is it saying false though? It should say true because that is one of the words that's in there. That's one thing that's kind of giving me a bit of a red flag there. Maybe I wrote that wrong. Z and L. But Z is an L because I know because we appended it. That's weird that it's saying false. Z and L. If k is equal to 600,000, ah, it's because it should be x here, not k. All right, moment of truth. Hopefully that's why I just didn't find it and gave up immediately. Okay. If that still finishes in less time, damn true. Okay, um, we either have to go to bigger numbers for this to be true or there is some weird optimization going on because normally normally the dictionary would be much faster but something is going on that it's not showing up and I, I mean I can go with bigger numbers but I don't want to make you all wait here while I run like ridiculously large numbers but I'm gonna do one more try one two three Four, five, so I'm gonna do 20 million. Okay, and that's gonna be the last one, and then we'll call it a day on that one. And we will pick up from here on the next video, which I will probably record right now because I am very well. What I'll do is this I'm gonna leave this running for a billion if it still lets me down right now, and then when it finishes, I'll start recording the next video so you can just you know. Watch the next video, it'll pop up here, and then uh, I'll let you know how that went, okay? Uh, I can see that even the 200,000 took a while, 43 seconds. So, let's see if Python 18, one, two, three, one, two, three. Let's see, you know, that one should in theory take longer, so this might take like a few minutes. So I am going to end the video here, leave you hanging. Uh, frankly though, whatever happens here i'm telling you like believe me it's like oh my god this this is just like i am i'm now now i feel confused at this um dang this thing okay so 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 i have a suspicion of what's happening a little bit of a suspicion 
I'm thinking that what's happening is the actual insertion for the dictionary is taking all the time, whereas the searching is not. Because inserting into the dictionary, you have to compute the hash function to figure out where it goes. And that takes a little bit of time. So the initial insertion is much slower with the dictionary than it is with the list. So maybe that's what's taking the majority of the time. That's my theory. Uh, and then, of course, when you're searching with the other method, you're just doing a linear search, which is slower than the other one. So I think what I can do to try and test this and show you a good case is I'd have to do a bunch of searches. So like do like 20 or 30 searches for a, let, for, for a word in the list method versus 20 or 30 searches in the dictionary method. And I think their dictionary would win. Well, I know, I know that it should win, but it's kind of hard to show. But trust me, when you're dealing with real data, these, you know, I feel, I feel, I feel bad because you're like, well, look at the data, They're, you, you know, believe the science, or whatever. Like, sure, but you know, this is not a very well controlled experiment. This is just one example. It's not, it's not what the trend is. Okay, so in this case, just trust me, the dictionary would be faster. Building it is slower, but once you got to build, that thing is fast. And like I said, I got code down from five minutes to five seconds, thanks to things like sets and dictionaries. So do not take them by granted just because in this special case, this was not. This also does show that when you're dealing with something tiny, what's when six million is tiny or 20 million is tiny, you know, even in those cases, you know, a list will do just fine. So there's an argument to be made that dictionaries can be reserved for big things, but sometimes they just like, they just make sense to use as a data structure too. So there's that. Anyways, I'll leave you with that and we will pick up from here on the next video. Thanks for watching and have a great weekend.